Uh, tonight we're, we're calling on Ken. Ken is going to talk to you about keeping your brain sharp. Um, probably you all know that when you get older, the things that people are concerned about right away are really from here up. It's like you are concerned about your hearing. That seems to be one of the things that challenges us. And then your eyes, that seems to be another thing that challenges us. And then your brain, you know, you always worry about, am I thinking right? Am I, what's my memory doing? You know, and it's, it's a little scary sometimes, but there's a lot that can be done if you know what, what to do um, to improve your ability to stay sharp in all of those areas. I have a 97-year-old mother that's really interesting. I mean, that's really old. And she's in great, she's in very good shape, but she has problems with her eyes. And we do all that we can to keep that going. And she has problem with her hearing, and it's kind of a hereditary thing. But she always says, but they're not going to take my brain away. I'm really still really good. And that's true, but we work at it a lot. She works at it, and I work at it with her. So it's not just something where she sits in a chair at 97, and expects that it'll all be okay. We do a lot, some of the things that maybe Ken's gonna talk about tonight um, to keep her brain stimulated and even growing at 97. So we have Ken Steller here. He's from Cheshire, Connecticut, and he brings a wealth of experience here. He really, he's, he's uh, he has been trained in psychology and counseling, and he's done all this training for people, project managing, facilitating individual groups and teams. He's been a human resource person, and he provides consulting, program design, and training in the following areas, conflict resolution and med mediation, change management, team building, process improvement, staff development, stress management, mental fitness, and collaborative decision making. He's been doing this for over 30, 25 years uh, in both organizational and clinical settings uh, and bringing programs to groups like this. He's a certified mediator, and he is now a mediator for the Hartford Area Mediation Program. Uh, as a training consultant for business, service, government, and educational organizations, Ken has worked with very diverse audiences at all organizational levels, both in the United States and internationally. And as I said, his graduate degrees are in psychology and in counseling. And he, had, he has developed, created a program, which he'll talk about tonight, called Pumping Neurons. He's going to talk a lot about how the field of neuroscience has influenced our knowledge of what the brain does and how we can stay sharp, right? Thank you, Barney, Dad. Good evening. How's everybody doing? Excellent. Um, actually, my day job right now is with the University of Connecticut. I do organizational development, uh, project management for them. Uh, but I've been interested in this uh, field of mental fitness since the mid-90s. While I was working as a consultant, I was uh, affiliated with a nonprofit educational organization in Hartford called the Thinking Center. It's now called the Think Well Center. And my mentor was at a remarkable woman named Louise Loomis. Uh, she was a uh, retired science teacher from the Hartford School System. She got an educational doctorate in critical and creative thinking. She started this program out of her home in Hartford and it's kind of grown since then. So I started taking classes with her at first and then she asked me to start doing some training for her organization. And uh, she asked me to take a look at the current research in the neurosciences to see how we could translate this information so that people could use it. So I've been working on this idea of uh, pumping neurons for a number of years now. It's gone through a number of different variations. And what I'm going to share with you tonight is some of the things I've learned from my research and my experience doing this program. But before I get started, I've got a couple of things I'd like you to do first. If you haven't already done so, I'd like you to meet one other person in this room whom you do not know. Maybe someone at your table, that's fine. 
I may have to get up if you know all. Um, uh, 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 you to try to remember them. Don't write them down, but I want to try to remember them because I'm going to ask you what they are a little bit later in the program. So here we go. Here are the three things. Spoon, rose, and pencil. Right? Spoon, rose, pencil. All right. Now I've got one more challenge for you. We're going to actually try out a memory technique called the method of loci or the loci method. And this actually goes back to the ancient Greeks. If they were going to the market to buy some stuff, they didn't have any pen and pencil to write things down with paper so they had to remember it. So what they use is this method, they would remember locations in their house and they would associate the things they want to buy with those locations. So we're going to use five locations in this room and then we're going to associate our shopping list with those locations. So one location is going to be that door right back there. Front door, okay. Second location is going to be this cabinet over here where the C sign is. Third location is going to be the door to the kitchen. Out or in? Out or in? Either one, you choose. <laughs> Fourth location is going to be the screen up here behind me. And the fifth location is going to be the lights above us. Right, so we got the door, we got the cabinet, we got the inner out, your choice of the kitchen door. We've got the screen and we've got the lights. Those are our five locations. They're not going to move, we, we can fix them in our minds. So now here's our shopping list. And I'll show you what we're going to do with that list. First thing we're going to buy are carrots. So what I want you to do is picture Bugs Bunny outside that door chewing on some carrots. Now the reason this works so well is if you can get a visual image, and the wilder the better, it seems to stick in your memory. So try to get a vision of Bugs Bunny chewing on some carrots outside the door, and that's what we want to buy are the carrots. Okay, so that's the first item. Second item we're going to associate with the cabinet. We're going to buy some butter. So I want you to imagine a pile of sticks of butter on that cabinet over there, like uh, you're building a, a, a house or a wall or something, just using those rectangular sticks of butter piled up on that cabinet over there. So just picture that in your mind. Butter piled up hot, stacked up. Okay, That's the second item. Third item is oatmeal. So we're going to go to either, let's go to the outdoor there. Okay? And I want you to imagine, you know the Quaker Oats guy? The guy, you know, just like a Quaker? I want you to imagine him walking out with a big bowl of oatmeal. Try to get that image in your mind. And maybe he trips and, sp and spills all over the ground. <laughs> That's good. Next item is eggs. All right? so, I want you to imagine taking regular eggs and throwing them at that screen and seeing them splatter. So get an image of splattered eggs all dripping down on that screen up there. That's the image I want you to fix in your mind. The last item on your list, bar soap. So we've got the lights up here. I want you to imagine dangling from long strings bars of soap. They're so low that you've got to kind of wind your way through them to get from one part of the room to the other. So you got these bars of soap just dangling down, kind of waving around there, and you got to move around the way to get through the room. So we got the door, we got carrots. At the cabinet, we got the sticks of butter. 
Out of the outdoor there, we've got the Quaker Oat guy coming in and spilling oatmeal all over the place. We've got spider eggs on the screen, and we've got bar soap hanging from the light stand. So you got those images, right? That's good. Now, don't write that down, but I'm going to ask you what they are a little bit later in the program. So now we can talk about what we're actually going to do for the presentation tonight. I want to give you a little bit of understanding of how the brain works. We're going to open up the hood and look inside and see a little bit of how the brain works so you understand how it affects our mental capacity as we get older. I'm going to give your mind a workout. I hope you got a little nap today because I'm going to work you out tonight. You're going to get a little mental workout as part of this program today. And so, you know, I'll show you how you can do some, some mental exercises. I want you to help, I want to help you develop a personal mind sharpener program. So again, based on some of the things you're already doing or you learn, what are some other ways that you can keep your mind sharp as you get older? And the last thing, my objective is to encourage a lifelong mental fitness. For as long as you're around, I want you to stay sharp and keep working your mind. I want to show you some ways to do that. So those are my objectives for today. Now, before we get into the heavy-duty stuff, I'm going to give you a little warm-up quiz, what I call the Mind Sharpener Quiz. So these are basically true or false questions. So just don't shout them out. Just think in your mind whether this is true or false. First one says, highly intelligent people have larger than average brains. Now, I'm assuming that all of you are highly intelligent because you came to this program tonight. <laughs> so do you think your brains are larger than the people out there on the street? Larger, same size, what do you think? True or false? False. false. Yeah. It is false. Uh, all of us have a brain that's about two and a half to three pounds. Uh, but interestingly, even though we all have about the same size brain, where you have special talents or abilities where you've developed some of your potential, that part of the brain more, may be more densely packed with brain cells and neurons and the connections between them. In fact, when they looked at Einstein's brain after he died, that's his brain, they found out that a place called the parietal operculum, which is on the side of the brain, and interestingly, it covers things like mathematical reasoning, visual spatial reasoning, imagery. That part of his brain was about 15% larger than the average brain. And think about Einstein, the kind of work that he did, those are the kind of abilities he was demonstrating. But it's the same with everyone here in this room. Where you've developed your talents, your abilities, whether it's in uh, language or music or math or wherever you have your, your special abilities. If we were to look at that part of the brain that covers those abilities, we'd probably find that part of the brain maybe a little bit larger than the average brain as well. So even though we all have about the same size brain, where you have your special talents or abilities that you've developed, they're going to be find that that part of the brain may be a little bit larger than the average. This next one is sometimes a little controversial. On average, men have more brain cells than women do. <laughs> women are all starting to laugh already here. What do you think? Women don't want to answer, do you? It's actually true. Do you, you think it's true? Well, they've studied this and they find that men, on average, have about 20 million more brain cells than women. That sounds like a lot, but when you look at the whole context of the brain, where there's about 100 billion neurons, 20 million more or less aren't, aren't that great. Now, my wife's sitting over there, and I can assume, or anticipate when I get home tonight, she's going to say, so, you've got more brain cells than I do, huh? Why don't you use them, right? <laughs> I think like my wife. Next one, significant memory loss is inevitable as we grow older, and the degree of loss is directly linked to age. True or false? False. Yeah. True. Some people think it's true. They think once you get to the north side of 50, it's all downhill, right? You're going to lose your memory. By getting older, just by itself, is not a forecast that you're going to lose your memory. Now, there are things that cause memory loss, and we'll talk about them a little bit later in the program. As we get older, there is something called age-related memory decline or cognitive decline. So you may find that it takes you a little longer to learn new stuff. You don't process things quite as fast as you used to. So that can happen as we get older. And maybe some minor memory lapses here and there. But by itself, just getting older is not going to, you're not going to lose your memory. Now, there are things that cause memory loss. And there's another piece called age-related cognitive decline or impairment. So again, we start to see some impairment based on some things that we'll talk about in a little while. And then you get the extreme, which is the dementias like you get with Alzheimer's or other kind of severe diseases. 
So again, there's a, there's a continuum there that some things will cause memory loss or cognitive uh, decline. You can compensate for some of these things with some of the activities that I'll share with you tonight. There's a recognizable limit to how much the brain can learn. True or false? Oh. Very good. Absolutely false. When I was in graduate school, I used to go visit my grandmother. She's probably in her late 80s there. I'd say, you're still in school. Your head's going to explode. You're taking in too much information. <laughs> her generation felt, and you know, some people still feel, that you have a finite kind of capacity for learning new stuff. But what we've learned from neuroscience is that as long as you're alive and breathing, you can still learn and develop your brain. In fact, that's one of the things I want to encourage you to do if you're not already doing that, is to can you continue being active in your learning and growth and, and uh, uh, learning new stuff as you, as you get older. Last one, use it or lose it is a phrase that can be applied to the mind. Yes. Yes. That's absolutely true. In fact, that's a key message that we're getting from research in the sciences. Just like we've been told for a long time, we need to keep our bodies active as we get older. We need to keep our brains active as well. Once you retire, it doesn't mean you retire your brain. Just keep doing things that will help your brain continue to develop as long as you're alive and breathing. Now, you notice I'm using the terms brain and mind, and sometimes people think of those as the same thing. For our purposes here tonight, the brain is that organ that sits inside your skull. If you could open it up, you could see it and, and touch it. The mind is what you do with your brain. That's the, the cognitive abilities, memory, thinking, all that kind of stuff that happens within the brain. So I want to make that distinction. That's a philosophical question. Some people still are discussing what it is. And if you read different authors, you may find that some think it's the same thing, some think it's different. What the mind is is still up for debate sometimes with some, some people. So for our purposes here tonight, mind is what you do with your brain. That's the thinking process. So let's open the hood and let's look at your brain, see what's going on inside here. Paul McLean was a, a researcher in the neurosciences, and he came up with this concept called the triune or three-part brain. And so a useful way of thinking about how the brain is developed. And so if you look at that bottom there, you see the brain stem. That's the part of your brain that controls things like breathing, heart rate, digestion, things that you don't have to consciously be aware of. You don't pay attention to your heart or your lungs. They happen by themselves. That's what controls that part of your, your physiological function. You don't have to think about it. It happens automatically. They sometimes refer to this as the reptilian brain because we share this part of the brain with the reptiles on the planet. All living animals have this part of the brain. So again, basic physiological functions. The middle part of the brain sits on top of the brain stem. It's deep inside the brain. It's called the limbic system or the limbic brain. Sometimes you'll see this referred to as the mammalian brain, the mammal brain, because we share this part of the brain with a lot of the mammals on the planet. This is the part of our brain that's involved in learning, memory, and emotional control and regulation. Now, the outer part of the brain, the part that looks kind of like a cauliflower if you look at it, that's called the neocortex or neomammalian brain. We share this part of the brain with some of the higher primates, dolphins, whales, they all have this part of the brain as well. Now, it looks like a cauliflower, but if you touch it, it's got the texture of tofu or jello. It's very soft and pliable. It's about the thickness of two dimes, so it's a very thin coating over the, over the top of the brain. But this is where your higher level thinking takes place. So when you're making decisions, you're, you're weighing pros and cons, making a choice about something, you're, you're trying to judge or evaluate something, that typically takes place in a part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex, which is right behind your forehead. And they sometimes call this the executive brain. So this is the most recent part of our brain to develop. And when we have something like the fight or flight response when you're under stress, that's triggered by the brain stem and the limbic brain. The thinking part of the brain is, can sometimes override that. So when I do a stress management program, I talk more about that process. But it's helpful to know that we have this kind of evolutionary development in our brain. Now if you look, this is the left side of the brain. You'll notice that it's divided into something called lobes. And each of these lobes, the occipital lobe, parietal lobe, frontal lobe, and temporal lobe, all have their own functions. So for example, when you, when you process things visually, it's happening in the back of the brain called the occipital lobe. Now, my wife works with blind and low vision students, so she's very familiar with this part of the brain. Even though it looks like you're seeing the world through here, you're actually processing it in the back of your brain called the occipital lobe. 
On the side of your brain is called the temporal lobe. This is where you process sound, hearing, language, things like that. Music typically gets processed on the side of your brain, the temporal lobe. The parietal lobe is what processes sensory information. So I've asked you to feel what it's like to sit in your chair right now. And even though you're feeling your butt or your legs, it's being processed up here on that top part of your brain. And again, that frontal part is where you do your executive decision making and thinking and judging and things like that. So each of these areas have their own specialty. Now, we think that the brain is not just divided up into these different lobes, you actually have a holistic brain. So for example, if you lose part of your brain when you're younger, other parts of the brain will compensate. I recently read about uh, a situation with a young boy, six years old. They had to remove the whole left side of his brain. They thought, well, that part covers language. He'll never be able to speak. Well, in a couple of years, his brain compensated for that loss, grew new, new nerve connections, and he can now speak. I was like he never lost that part of his brain. So there's some amazing stuff about how the brain functions. We've learned a lot in the last 20 or 30 years, but there's a lot we still have to learn about the brain. Now, let me throw a couple big numbers at you. The first one is 100 billion. This is what they estimate is the number of nerve cells or neurons that we're born with. Now, in the course of our lives, we lose a number of these because if we don't use them, we lose them. And those of you that have raised children, you know that first year of life, that little helpless infant grows into, by the end of the first year, they're starting to walk or, or stand up. They're starting to vocalize or verbalize a little bit. They're starting to use their fine motor dexterity. That's because their nerve cells are being connected in that first year, and all throughout their, their, their adolescence and growing up. The fact is that even now, your nerve cells are, are connected. You know, so I'll talk more about that in a moment. Next number is a little bit bigger. It's one quadrillion. It's one with 15 zeros after it. This represents the number of potential connections you have between those 100 billion neurons. Now, just to give you an idea how enormous that number is, if we were to start counting from one to one quadrillion with a number about every second, how long do you think it would take us in this room to get to one quadrillion? 42 years. 42 years. That's true. OK. Well, any other thoughts? A thousand. A thousand years. Somebody's going to say one quadrillion seconds. <laughs> it would actually take roughly close to 32 million years. That's how huge that number is. Those are the connections that you have going on inside that skull of yours. So it's an amazing kind of a process. So let's talk about that working unit of the brain called a brain cell or a neuron. If you think of my fist as the neuron, each neuron has one axon. That's how it sends signals from one brain cell to another. And it sends it by sending a tiny elect electrical charge down in the axon. When it gets to the end, it releases a chemical called a neurotransmitter. That gets picked up by the next nerve cell in the communication network. That gets picked up by something called dendrites. So even though each nerve cell has one axon, it has potentially thousands of dendrites. And so each time you communicate, now let, me, let me give you an example. Right now, I'd like you to wiggle the big toe on your right foot and raise your left hand when you've done that successfully. Now, look how quickly you've done that. <laughs> now, what just happened? You heard sounds coming from me. Sounds. Your brain encoded, translated those sounds into a request to do something. Your brain then sent a signal down to the big toe on your right foot to wiggle. And then you got a signal coming back that said, hey, I did it. And then you voluntarily raise your left hand. That's how communication in your brain takes place. Every time you have a thought, every time you take an action, it's based on some kind of communication between these networks of nerve cells in your brain. And that's how your brain translates into mind. The thoughts you have, the actions you take, are all based on communication between those nerve cells. Now, another concept that has really come up with fairly recently is this idea of neuroplasticity. We have a plastic brain. What that means is that back in my grandmother's generation, they felt once you hit around 25, that's it. That's all you get for life. That's what your brain is. We now know that throughout our lifespan, our brain is constantly changing. Every time you learn something new, every time you have a new experience, every time you try something new, you're creating new networks of communication in your brain. 
And so that's why I say throughout your lifespan, you want to continue learning, ex you know, expanding your experience, trying new things. All that helps to keep your brain healthy. Donald Hebb is considered the father of neuroscience. This is a paraphrase of something called Hebb's Law. And what he said basically was that neurons that fire together, that communicate with each other, and they do it repeatedly, they start to wire together. So let me ask you, how many of you took a foreign language in high school? How many of you can speak it as well today as you did back in high school? Okay, a couple of, okay. Are you still speaking it, using that language skill? Well, I speak Mandarin, but I learned the English, so I, I still speak. You're using it. Well, yes. <laughs> Same thing over here, you're, you're using that language, right? For most of us, when we took a language, we learned it, we started wiring brain cells together that had that language. Now, if we stop using it after high school or college, what happens is they start to atrophy. Those connections wither and die. You still have a few left, so you know, a few key phrases or something like that you can still remember. So it hasn't gone away completely because you can still remember a little bit, right? But that's the way the brain works. If you don't use that information, you tend to lose it. That's why it's important to keep reinforcing those communication networks. The state of the art of brain science back in the 1800s was something called phrenology. What they did is they studied bumps on the head. Now, as a child, I fell a lot. I reached a bump into things, so I got a lot of bumps on my head. They'd have a field day with me. But they could feel the bumps on your head, and by basing that, those lumps, they could determine your intelligence, abilities, um, potential, personality characteristics. Now, some of you may be old enough. I know my mentor, Dr. Lou Louise Loomis, when she was a young child, she had people feeling her bed, because that was still around in the early 1900s. Now we know a lot more about the brain than we did back then, and it's based on a couple of things. One is we now have very sophisticated technology, CAT scans, MRIs, functional MRIs, that allow us to watch the brain at work without actually cutting somebody open and looking at their brain. We can give them a problem to solve, shoot them into an FMR, fMRI tube, watch the brain and see what parts of the brains light up as they try to solve a problem or think about something. So we've learned a lot about how the brain works based on this, this technology. The other thing that's helped us learn are longitudinal studies. Some of you may be familiar with something called the Nunn study. Um, Dr. David Snowden, a psychologist, he's retired now, but for many years he was following this uh, group of retired nuns from the, the school sisters of Notre Dame. They have a retirement community out in Mankato, Minnesota. They also have one here in Reading, Connecticut. They also participated in the study. And every year we'd go back and he'd interview them, give them some tests. And when they passed on, they would donate their, science, their, their brains to be looked at. And so what they found, for example, is that some of the older nuns in their 90s, some in their, in their hundreds, even though they were still relatively functioning pretty well in their old age, when they actually looked at their brains, they were in the early stages of Alzheimer's. They could see some of that stuff going on there. But they didn't show much decline. And when I looked at their lifestyle, they found that those nuns that, nuns that lived longer, stayed active, and, and were healthier longest, tend to be very actively involved and engaged in their community. They volunteered, they taught, they read, they did stuff. They didn't just sit on the rocking chair passing time. So that's one of the things we learned is that staying active as we get older, physically as well as mentally, is one of the things that helps to preserve our brain. The other thing they found is that when these women entered the order, usually in their teens or early 20s, they had to write an autobiography. And they had those autobiographies, so they compared them to what, how the people were now in old age, and they found that those that wrote a very detailed autobiography, again, tend to have better mental faculties when they got older. And there's a reason for that, which I'll share with you in a moment. So here are some things we've learned from the Nun study and other longitudinal studies about what it takes to keep our mind sharp as we get older. Intellectual stimulation. So the more you learn, the more you learn and, and educate yourself, uh, either with formal classes or just on your own, you're building what they call cognitive reserve. You're building up all those connections between the brain cells that, again, if you start to get stroke, Alzheimer's, things like that, you can lose some of those connections and still have connections in reserve. That's what they think happened with some of those nuns, is they had a lot of cognitive reserve built up over the years, which started in their early early years. That's why they had those detailed autobiographies. So again, you know, whatever you're doing right now, uh, some of you are probably taking classes, 
That's one thing to stimulate your the, the nerve cell connections and to intellectually stimulate yourself to continue to do that. Strenuous activity. Now, why do you think strenuous activity is good for the mind? Oxygen, yeah. So that activity helps the heart pump blood to the brain. Now, your brain is about 2% of your body's weight, but it takes about 20% of your body's energy. So the way it gets that energy through oxygen and glucose is through circulation. So everybody take a deep breath. Get that oxygen in there. Good. Stress management. One of the things we know about stress is that chronic prolonged stress can damage the brain. It can affect the body's immune system, but it can also damage the brain. One particular part of the brain called the hippocampus, which is critical for learning and memory. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. So, yeah, we all have stress periodically, but if you're experiencing chronic prolonged stress, it can damage both the body and the mind over time. I can make a difference. Now, no matter how old you are, you have this sense that I can still contribute to my family, to my community, to organizations like the Senior Center here. You're still involved and engaged. You're still active. And that's what's important. You still feel like you can make a difference in your own life and people's lives. And the last one is staying connected. We know that people that have others around them, friends, family, those kinds of connections have a value to prevent getting uh, mental decline as we get older. So again, think about some friends you know that may be isolated, um, not getting involved with other people. Those people tend to lose their mental faculties quicker on average than people that stay actively engaged with other people. So again, programs like SEA, like the Senior Center, are opportunities to engage with other people. Very important. So I talked about you know, the, the value of exercise, strenuous activity. What they find is that things that are good for the heart are also good for the brain. Because again, because of circulation, getting that, that energy up there that, that the brain needs. So again, if you don't have a physical activity, I know they have programs here at the Senior Center. Um, before you get started with something, check with your health care provider, make sure you're okay to do stuff. But try, if nothing else, try walking. You know, do walking. Uh, there are classes here that you can take, you know, classes in other venues. But it's important to stay physically active as much as you can. Recognizing that you know, we develop aches and pains and other chronic problems as we get older, but try as best you can to stay active. The other reason why you want to stay physically active is when you do aerobic activity, it releases something in the brain called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It's a protein that actually helps brain cells, helps replenish brain cells, but also helps stimulate the growth of new brain cells. So here's an important finding from maybe the last 30 years or so in the neurosciences. Up until about 30 years ago, we felt that you didn't get any new brain cells once you were born. That what you're born is what you get. Now we know that the hippocampus, remember that part that's important for memory and learning, it's also producing new brain cells. We don't know what it does with them. And so that's one of the areas of research right now in the neurosciences is how could we possibly migrate those new brain cells for example, somebody has Alzheimer's, somebody's had a stroke, to get to part, part of the brain that might have been damaged by some of these things, if we can do that, then we can help restore the brain. So again, that's one of the areas that they're looking at right now. But exercising by itself will release this BDNF, which is good for your brain. So I was looking at this research in the neurosciences, uh, you know, going back to the mid-90s, and I said, well, how can I put this into a program that people might be able to utilize this information. I came up with the idea of a brain gym. Now, someone already used that name, so I had to call it pumping neurons, which I like as well. <laughs> but just if you were to go to a gym to work out, real gym, you would work on strength. You would do calisthenics, resistance exercises, try to build up the strength in your muscles. You work on flexibility, so you do stretching, yoga, Pilates to keep yourself loose and limber. You work on endurance, so that's where the aerobic activity comes in to build your heart and lungs. Capacity. So in the brain gym, we're going to work on those same three areas, but we're going to do it mentally. So mental strength is reflected in attention, concentration, and memory. Mental flexibility is reflected in your ability to think creatively. Not just artistically, but creative problem solving for everyday types of problems. And mental endurance is reflected in your sustained thinking for problem solving and decision making. So I've created 
exercise in each of those areas. And I'm going to give you some examples right now. You're going to get a little workout as we go through this. So we're going to start with mental strength. By the way, what was the food item outside the door there? Yeah. Yeah. Good, good. What was hanging from the lights? Oh, oh, good, very good. <laughs> yeah. like All right, I'm going to give you a series of numbers. I'm going to start with a series of four random numbers. The same out loud. When I'm done saying that, I want you to repeat them just the way I said them in your head. Don't say it out loud, just repeat it in your head. So if I said one, two, three, four, you would say in your head one, two, three, four. It's not going to be that easy. And I'll add a number each time. So I'm going to start with four, and then I'll add one each time. So here's the first series. Three, two, eight, six. Next one. Five, seven, two, nine, five. Next one. Four, two, nine, three, seven, five. It's getting tougher. One more. One, six, four, seven, three, eight, two. That was probably a little bit of a stretch. That was seven digits. And when they research people learning something new about seven bits of information, give or take two is what most people can, how they, you can develop this over time. If you practice this, you can expand it, but we're just going to give you a little taste of it here. You have to pay attention to get that. So that's building your attention. Now what you may have found towards the end there is you got the first number and the last number, the rest in the middle kind of got jumbled up. That's something in psychology called the primacy and the recency effect. We tend to remember what we heard first and what we heard last. When there's a lot of information in between, it gets kind of mixed up. So you've got to practice to get all those middle numbers. I'm going to give you numbers again. I'm going to start with a series of three. This time, I want you to say them, repeat them backwards from the way that I say them. So if I say three, two, one in your head, you would say one, two, three. Right? Okay. So here we go. I'll start with a series of three. Five, eight, one. No, re reverse it and do it in your head. Don't say it out loud. Next one. Six, one, seven, four. Next one. Six, two, eight, four, one. Try one more. This is the grand slam here. Seven, three, five, one, nine, two. That is almost easier than four. For you, it's easy. Oh, good. What you're using for this particular task, not just attention, but something called working memory. You've got to hold that information long enough to do something with it, which is to reverse it. So that's a little bit more of a challenge. But some of the research now shows that some of these activities that are promoted as brain exercise or mental fitness exercises, working memory like we just did is one of the things that we can work on that seems to have carryover value to other activities in life. A lot of things they do in some of these brain fitness programs will help you be good at doing that particular task. What we're looking for are the kind of activities you do that have carryover to real life activities. And this is one of them. <clears throat> okay, here's another activity. I'd like you to try to spell these words backwards. In your head, don't say them out loud. First of all, spell the word world backwards in your head. Next, spell the word brother backwards in your head. Now let me stop there and ask you, what strategies are you using right now to do this? Are you trying to picture the word in your mind? Because yeah. many people are very visual. I'm just saying it out loud, so it's hard sometimes to, to do that when you're not an auditory person. So you, what you're doing is you're translating it to something visual so you can see that word brother, and then you can start to see the letters backwards. So again, that's the way we approach some of these tasks. If I showed it up on the screen, it might be easier for you to do that. I just flash it up there quickly, 
you looked at it, your visual, you could do it more easily. So what we're going to do is different types of activities here. Some are visual, some are auditory, to give you a range of activities. Here's another thing that you can do backwards. We can all say the alphabet A to Z very quickly. I want you to start with Z and do the alphabet backwards to A in your head. Start with Z and work backwards to A. Now, I'm going to stop you there. I mean, it's something you can practice on your own. But my guess is what you're doing is some strategy variations of taking the last three letters, mm -hmm. X, Y, Z, do it a couple times, and then reverse. So you do two, three, or four at a time. That's a strategy that you can learn, use to learn new information. You've got a big chunk of information you're trying to learn, break it down, what they call an education or learning, chunking it down. Mm -hmm. Take smaller bits and try to learn those smaller bits, it becomes a little bit easier. You try to lose, use all 26 letters at once, it's really a challenge. And what I do is when I do a kind of a multi-session program with, with a group like this, if we're going to meet, let's say, for four or six times, I would give you this as a challenge on the first session and ask you to practice it. Because after a couple of days of practicing, you start to develop those links, that communication links, that wire that information in your brain. So by the end of, let's say, four or five or six sessions, if you practice it every day, you'd be very good at saying the alphabet backwards. Now, who cares about saying the alphabet backwards? But it's a way to demonstrate how powerful these techniques are when you want to learn something for real, is that the more you repeat it, the more you reinforce it, the more you develop that communication network in your brain that has that information. All right, so let me do one more strength-building exercise. This is a a word math problem. So I'm going to read you a problem. I'll do it twice. And you've got to hold on. So this is working memory. You're going to have to hold on to the information to do some calculations with it. So here we go. Mary invites four friends to lunch. One friend calls the day before and asks if she can bring her two children who are visiting from Oklahoma. Mary says yes and then decides to add her son, daughter-in-law, and granddaughter to the guest list. How many guests will Mary have in total? Let me read it one more time and try to do the calculations in your head. Mary invites four friends to lunch. One friend calls the day before and asks if she can bring her two children who are visiting from Oklahoma. Mary says yes and then decides to add her son, daughter-in-law, and granddaughter to the guest list. So again, how many guests will Mary have in total? Ten. All right, very good. You're sharp. See, I thought you were a sharp group. That's working memory in action. You have to hold on to that information. You have to translate it into a mathematical problem, do the calculations, and then come up with the answer. And that's what working memory is all about. So let's move on. That's a little bit of mental strength activity. Oh, let me give you one more. This is called the Stroop test. This is a, something that is the basis of some programs in mental fitness. And what you're going to see, and I'll give you an example, you're going to see a word and a color. The word is red, but the color is blue. So what you need to do is just think of the color. Your brain's going to want to say the word, because we're very linguistically oriented. But I'm going to show you a whole bunch of these colored words. And what I want you to do in your head, that's, don't say them out loud, say, them as quick, say the color as quickly as you can. And notice if you're trying to read the word and not see the color, that's, what you gotta, that's the, where the concentration comes in. Now, if you're colorblind or if you're not sure what the color is, just say whatever it looks like to you. It doesn't matter. But just say what the color looks like, not the word. Okay? So, again, try to do this as quickly as you can. So notice how your brain tries to read the words. It's hard to force it to read, the, to look at the color. That's the exercise there in that particular one. Right? So let's talk about flexibility. Flexibility is about creative thinking. So here's an exercise in flexibility. Think about what this design could be. It's not, there's no right answer. So what does it mean to you? And when you come up with one answer, try to come up with two more. That's where the flexibility, because once we see it as one thing, our mind wants to keep seeing it that way. So I want you to see it as one thing, and then force yourself to see it two other ways as well. Now turn to someone sitting near you and share what you just came up with. Doesn't matter. Again, there's no right answer, so whatever it meant to you, just come up with and see if you came up with similar things or different things.
Flexibility, seeing more than one possibility here. Here's a more another exercise in flexibility. This is a common brick. You can see the dimensions. Besides using it to build something, what other uses could you think of for this brick? Plant holder. Plant holder. Yeah. What else? Candle holder. Candle holder. What else? Door stop. What is it? A hole for a mouse. A hole for a mouse. A door stop. What else? Fishing rod holder. Fishing rod hole. Yeah. Get rid of stress. So he says door stop. Okay. Now, if you're struggling to think of something, this is where you can, again, exercise your 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 mind by taking common things like this and say, well, what else could this be used for? How else could I use this? That's where the flexibility comes in. It's flexible thinking. Now, a number of years ago, I was contracted to do a, a training program on creativity for managers. And so I did a lot of research on what supports creative, creative, the creative process. And whether it's artistic creativity or business creativity, whatever it might be, I found there are two real keys to creativity. One was just what you just worked on, which is flexibility. People that are creative can look at something one way and then look at it a different way. They have that ability to look at things differently than other people can. And so that flexibility is one of the things that supports creative problem solving. The other one is association. If you think about some of the creative people you know, they can connect things that other people can't connect. They see things that other people can't see. They create these links or these associations that bring out the novel things. That, and you think about something like Steve Jobs or Apple Computer. Again, they came up with all these different products that other people couldn't think of. So we can see artistic creativity is this way, but the creativity we use for everyday living. For example, some, let's say one of your neighbors comes to you and says, I'm always losing my keys. Do you have any ideas on how I can stop losing my keys? What might you tell that neighbor? Put them in a bowl by the door, same place every day. What else? Put a little rack that says keys. What else? Put them around your wrist. Get one of those little clapper things so that it makes a sound whenever you clap. There's no right answer. That's where creativity comes in. There are some things that have one answer, but there are a lot of things, situations in life, that can have more than one answer. So building your flexibility, building your connections, your associations. And we all do this. For example, um, you, know, you go out on a nice day, you look at those cumulus clouds, and you start to see shapes, right? So I can see uh, an elephant over there on the left. I see... Uh, the Starship Enterprise on the right from Star Trek. Um, I can see a little turtle here. A little turtle shell with a head there. So again, they're not there, but I see them. Okay? So here's a, some of you may be familiar with the Rorschach, if you've done any clinical now. This is not a Rorschach card. This is actually from a series of prints done by the pop artist Andy Warhol. And if you look at that, if you look at it long enough, you're going to start to see things. Figures, objects, actions, things will start to emerge. And in you know, clinical psychology, they call this projective testing, but I'm not going to analyze your responses. But you know, if you look at that, you'll see things. They're not there. But you're using your own experience to create some associations. Part of the way our brain, our mind functions is when we're confronted by something ambiguous like this, we have to make sense of it. And the way we do that is we say, what does this look like? How is this familiar to me in some way? And that's where the association comes in. So expose yourself to activities like this, or looking at the clouds and coming up with ideas, things that it could be, is one way to exercise that flexibility. Now, this is not a Rorschach test. Uh, if you look at it, you'll start maybe to see some things. Uh, maybe something, start, again, this is what your mind is trying to do. What does this look like to me? Does this make sense to me? Now, it probably doesn't, but if I change the position, the dog. now you see something, right? Yeah. That dog's not there. But you're starting to create something that looks like a dog because you want to make sense of it. 
Everybody see the dog? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Asmus saw it before when it was laying down. <laughs> ah, see? Yeah, really good. Well, I have my head tilted. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, look at that. that. That helps. That helps. That's real. That's flexibility. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, looking at these uh, ambiguous pictures, now, is that Roman soldier standing under two <coughs> rectangular oh, yeah. columns? Or oh, three wow. columns? Oh, that's good. They're both, right? So again, those kind of ambiguous pictures can exercise our flexibility. One more example. This is a chalk art, a British artist named Julian Beaver. Um, the guy is real. The design there is not. And this is something called an anamorphic drawing. This is what it really looks. Right? It's the angle that you're looking at it that creates that 3D dimension. It looks like. So again, this is the way you kind of exercise that flexibility and associates by looking at things that maybe or may not make sense. So here's another exercise. In your mind, I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to imagine going into your bathroom, wherever that looks like to you. And I want you to imagine you're going to wash your hands. And so imagine you know, going up to the sink. You can feel the, the floor, whether you have carpet or linoleum or wood, whatever that is. Feel the floor on your feet. And then feel the, the texture of the faucet as you turn it. And hear the splashing of the water as it goes into the sink. Imagine picking up the bar of soap and lathering up. And feeling the water and the soap as you do that. The temperature of the water. And then imagine yourself turning off the faucets, taking a towel. Feel the texture of the towel as you dry your hands off as it goes from... Your hands go from wet to dry. And so what you just did is you used your creativity, your imagination. imagination. So it's another way to exercise your, your flexibility and association. Use that imagination. All right, let's go to endurance now. I've got a little, this is your final exam. It's a couple of problems. Some of them are word problems. Some of them are puzzle problems. But I'd like you to take a few minutes to work on these. If you don't have a pen and pencil, that's fine. You can just do them in your head. So let me start passing these around here. You can just give everyone a copy. Just start passing these around. Got some pens, huh? Good. Any extras here? Oh, good. Extras. Take the table over here. Oh, you didn't get it? Ah. So you do the side that says, sharpen your mind. All right, enough mental sweat. Let's go. So, the first one says, a woman from Connecticut married 10 different men from that state, didn't break any laws, none of the men died, she never divorced. How could this be? Justice, Justice. Justice of the peace or a minister, she married other people. <laughs> this is a word problem. And if you're not used to them, you've got to, this is where the flexibility comes in. You've got to think beyond, well, how could she marry people and not get divorced? And not just, there's got to be other possibilities. And that's what that comes in. Second one is, a, a, again, a mental math problem. What you come up with for the answer to number two? Seventy. Seventy. Excellent. Now, some of you like to do word jumbles, so you'd probably be very good at the next one. If you don't, it might have been harder. So the first one, first country was what? Oh. Then? Brazil. Then? Germany. Germany and China. OK. The third one was Germany. Germany. Brazil. OK. So the next one is looking for the patterns here. So again, if you're not familiar, this can be a very difficult part of it, problem type of problem, but you look for the patterns. So for the first one there, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, what's the pattern? 13, 15, yeah. 15. Two between each one, so next to 13, 15. 
What's the pattern for the second one? Seven, 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 one, seven, one, seven, one. So again, you can see what the next two are like. Right? So which of the five items, of, of the five items below, which is the least like the others? What'd you come up with? Novel. Novel. The others are all Novel. references. Some of the people say Atlas because they think it's mostly maps. So that's why it might be different. So I'll, we'll accept that. We'll accept that. So this is just an example of sustained thinking for problem solving and decision making. So what we've just done is exercise in each of those areas, mental strength, mental flexibility, mental endurance. I want to switch gears a little bit now and talk about learning and memory. Now, if you were here earlier, you uh, were listening to some Mozart. And the question is, will listening to Mozart make you smarter? No. no. Okay. Well, it's, uh, all right. Yeah. I said that pretty forcefully. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can get, uh, I'm going to play a piece of music. Would get smarter by listening to Mozart. So, Gordon Shaw and Francis Rouser were two researchers in the early 90s. They thought that listening to classical music might make students smarter. So they took a group of students, they divided them into three groups before they took a visual spatial test. One group just sat there quietly, second group listened to natural sounds, third group listened to this very piece of music, so now D for two pianos. When we gave them the test, the group that listened to this piece of music scored a little better than the other two groups. Now, they went on to write a book called The Mozart Effect. Uh, Zell Miller, who was the governor of Arkansas at the time, proposed that every newborn child in Arkansas would get a classical CD. <laughs> Marketing people got a hold of this information and went crazy, so you got things like Mozart for your mind. Just listen to this and you'll get smart. Unfortunately, their original results were not replicated. So I'm sorry to say that just by listening to this music, you're not going to get smart. It's a nice musical experience, and they put you in a good conducive learning state, but it won't raise your IQ by itself. Sorry. So the answer to that is no. Okay. So let's talk about intelligence and, and learning. They talk about two different types of intelligence. One is crystallized intelligence. This is the knowledge that you gain over the course of your life. Factual data type information. The other type is fluid intelligence. This is the Intelligence you use to solve problems you haven't confronted before. So some of the things that maybe you're just working on, you've not done those type of problems before, you have to use your fluid intelligence to try to solve novel problems. So let me give you some examples of what we mean by these two types of intelligence. So crystallized intelligence would be things like how many senators in the U.S. Senate? About 100. 100, right? Oh, what temperature does water freeze? Or zero degrees centigrade. How many ounces in a quart? Okay. So that's crystallized intelligence, knowledge of facts and information like that. Fluid intelligence is like the problem you just did, so looking for a pattern. So what would you get for this 1, 3, 6, 10, 15? Okay. So you go from 2, 3, 4, 5, so it would be 6, so you got 21. Solve this next problem in your head. There, there are twice as many pencils as rocks. Three times as many rocks as marbles, there's one marble, so how many pencils are there? Don't say it out loud, just try to solve this first. So this is fluid intelligence now, reasoning. If you like to do logic puzzles, that's fluid intelligence. So what'd you come up with? Six. Six, six. good, good, excellent. So that's fluid intelligence. Learning. There are three main channels of learning. One is auditory, you hear the information, you take it in that way, like when I was saying those numbers before. Another is visual, you're looking at the screen here, so you're taking in visual information. And the third type is kinesthetic, where you're taking notes, you're applying it in some way, you're doing something with it. Now, most of us have a preferred method of learning new information. Most of us are visual, some people are auditory, some people like to do it kinesthetically. If you use all three, if you're trying to learn something new, use all three channels because it reinforces the connection between your brain cells that has that information. It's going to reinforce that information. So that's one strategy that you can use. Right now we have so much technology around us that the information coming in is almost overwhelming. Now those of you that try to keep up with emails and 
new information, if you get on the computers, it's almost overwhelming to try to keep up with all that information. If you look at the young people today, when they're studying, you know, remember when I studied in high school, I would sit at my desk, have good lighting, no distraction, no radio, study one subject for a while, finish that, go on to the next subject. My son, our son just graduated from uh, the uh, UConn Masters in Education program last spring. Throughout high school and college, his method of study would be laying down on the floor, on the couch, on the bed. He'd have the laptop, the iPod, the book, <laughs> smartphone. Everything was going at the same time. And what he'd be doing is shifting his attention. Now, we think of that as multitasking. But we don't truly multitask. What we do is we shift our attention very quickly between tasks. You can only consciously pay attention to one thing at a time. So for the people you know, learning today, when they're using this kind of a strategy, they're going along, studying one thing, drop that, pick up something else, drop that. So what they're doing is they're constantly interrupting the flow of learning. Some of them are becoming very good at it. Our son graduated with honors, not to brag. <laughs> but he was very good at it, but it's still what we show, what we know from st studying this kind of approach to learning is that it's not efficient. You're constantly picking up new information and trying to catch up. So if you go back to something else, you don't start where you left off. You've got to pick up where you were and then go on from there. So it's not an efficient way to do our jobs or to learn, but we're starting to do that because of the nature of the technology and a lot of information that we're dealing with right now. So it's something to be aware of. When we learn something new, it goes through that little piece called the hippocampus. It's kind of the switching station for new memories to get into old, long-term memory. I mentioned before that stress can damage the hippocampus. So if you're going through a really chronic, long period of stress, you may notice that your memory starting to suffer a little bit. You don't remember things quite as well. The good news is that if you get past that stress or learn how to manage it, your brain recovers. It can heal itself. So be aware of that. To test out memory, I want you to try something. I want you to recall something that happened to you in high school. Whatever it does, matter. the first thing that comes to your mind, I want you to play with that memory. I want you to see what was happening when you were there at that time. What were the sounds that were going on around you? What were you doing? Who else was around? Try to picture it, try to hear it, and try to use that kinesthetic sense of what you were doing. And just play with that memory for a few moments, and then I'll ask you some questions about it. So now, let's talk about what was happening in your brain when you were doing that. Wilder Penfield is a neuro, was a neurosurgeon. Back in the 50s, he was doing brain surgery on a woman. And because the brain has no pain receptors, he could think the woman was awake. And he touched a part of her brain, and all of a sudden, she started talking about a memory. And so the theory back 50 years ago was that each memory has a discrete point in your brain. If you just touch that point, you're going to have that memory. What we now know, the memory you just had was really an assemblage from different parts of your brain. So if you were seeing what was happening back in high school, that comes from that occipital region, which stores visual information. If you heard sounds, maybe you were at a school dance and you were hearing the music playing, that's coming from the temporal lobe. If you had a vice versa, or some emotion that you had, it could have been a positive emotion or a negative emotion, it sort of fixed some of that memory in your brain as you were thinking about it. So, this is, has a lot of ramifications, for example, for eyewitness testimony. And then a lot of studies in social psychology. Take a group of people like this. We'll show them a dramatic scene like a bank robbery or an accident. You'll come back in three weeks. And we'll ask you, well, what did you see? What do you remember from that? And people will remember different things. And they'll be absolutely sure that's the way it happened. So what we know is that memory is not fixed. It's malleable. It changes over time. And the other part of that is that that emotion is a very strong component. You ever walk into a bakery and you have these smells that remind you of your mother's kitchen or a bakery that you went to when you were a kid? Smell is a very powerful sense. And so smells oftentimes will bring back memories of things that you have an association with. Sound also, uh, you may be listening on the radio, um, and all of a sudden you hear a song that was popular when you were young. Now, you haven't thought about this for years, and all of a sudden, you're flooded with memories of what was happening around the time that you, that song was popular. So 
So again, it's that emotional connection that often fixes things in our brain. When you look at the research on memory, medical doctors, psychologists, neuropsychologists, neuroscience, they all have different language for talking about memory. So I'm going to give you a, a model for understanding the different types of memory, <coughs> recognizing that uh, some ways are described differently. We have what we call semantic memory. Sometimes you'll see this referred to as explicit memory or um, uh, got the other one. So semantic, explicit. Um, and what this is is memory for facts, data. So if you like to play Jeopardy, if you like to play Trivial Pursuit, things like that that require data, then you probably have good semantic memory. Does anybody remember the data of the Battle of Hastings? Who said it? 1066. When was the last time you thought about the Battle of Hastings? Probably been a while, right? Unless you're a historian. There you go. So there's the association. So notice how an association connects to that information. But that's semantic information. It's just data, facts, and knowledge. Second type of memory is procedural, sometimes called implicit. This is that if you haven't ridden a bike for a while, and all of a sudden you jump on a bike, you, your brain still remembers how to do it. So it's kind of stored there. You can't, it would be hard to describe, to tell somebody else, how do you ride a bike? You just do it. And so that's that procedural, things you do in a certain pattern or way, uh, driving a car, multiplication tables, the alphabet, things you always do in the same way tend to get stored in procedural memory. And the third is episodic. These are episodes from your life. So if I asked you what you had for breakfast this morning, most of you probably tell me, especially we have the same thing every day. But if I asked you what you had for dinner five months ago on Saturday, you know, yes, unless you have, yeah. Unless you have the same thing every Saturday, it might be hard to remember, but it's an episode that's unique to you. So we have these three types of memory, and then we add the element of time. We have short-term memory, and we break that down to immediate. So I'm going to ask you to remember those numbers forward. That was immediate. If you had to remember now, you probably forgot all those numbers. Didn't have to hold on to that information. Just need it for a few seconds. We also have short-term working memory. So here's where we're going to challenge you. What was the name of the person that you met at the beginning of the program? Try to think about who that was. Right? So tell me you remember. Again, that's working memory. You hold on to it for about a little over an hour. Don't say them out loud, but what are the three things I showed on the screen? Say it to yourself first. At the beginning of the program, I showed you three things on the screen. I said, try to remember them. Spoon, rose, and pencil. Very good. That's short-term working memory. Now, one last test. We have five items. Don't shout them out yet. Just think, what were the five items? And remember where we located them. Let's see if you can remember all five items on that list before we go over the list. All right, so here you go. We had carrots, remember Bugs Bunny outside the window. We had the sticking letters on the cabinet. We had the Quaker Oats guy come out and spill the oatmeal. We had the eggs splattered on the screen. Marshall pints on the light. Notice if you, how you remember that, because you made those associations. If I just gave you that list by itself, it would be a lot harder to remember. So that's the power of using that association to help you remember it. We also have long-term memory, and that could be long-term semantics. So again, things you learned in high school, language, history, whatever it might be, that would be part of long-term memory, in semantic information. Procedural, so again, thinking about things you haven't done for a while, but you may still remember them. And episodic memory, so again, remembering what happened to you in high school, that event, that's long-term episodic memory. So I'm going to give you a test. Long-term semantic memory. Can you name, don't say it out loud, but just want to think about it, name the presidents of the United States from Truman to Obama. And I'll give you one clue, there are 12 all together. 12 all together. So start with Truman and end up with Obama, see if you can fill in the other 10. I'll give you a moment to work on that and then I'll show you who they are. 
Now, if you're not a current event fan, you don't like history and stuff like that, you don't keep up on that stuff, it might be hard to remember. So for those that do a lot of reading, like history, like current events, this might come easier to you. Yeah? All right, here you go. Got Truman, Ike, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, a lot of people forget Ford, Carter, Reagan, Bush 1, Clinton, Bush 2, and Obama. Okay. That's long-term semantic memory, factual information. For those that's not important to remember those things, it's, it's meaningless. But some people that's important. For extra bonus points, how many can name the vice president? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you, just about you. Right. Talk about the three R's of memory. Let's talk about how do you get good memory. Three R's. First is receive. You got to get that information in the first place. So when you were meeting that person before, if you didn't pay attention to their name, you probably forgot it right away. So you got to get that information into your brain. That's what they call it, encoding it, getting it into the brain. So you got to receive it. You got to retain it. That's where remembering, recalling, using that fixes that information in your head. So if you want to learn something new, you practice it over time. You repeat it, you rehearse it. That fixes that information in the neural connections in your brain. That helps you retain it. The third R is to retrieve it. I know that name. Oh. <laughs> you know, it's on the tip of my tongue. You know? it's, it's there. So retrieving it is one of the difficult parts of it. So we say, well, did the name start with an A? That's with a B? Did it say? That's a strategy. Where do I know that person from? If you know a person, let's say from the senior center, and you see him out in a store, the face is familiar, but you can't place it because you, you're not seeing them in their usual place. So you start to think, well, where do I know that from? Is it from work? Is it from the neighborhood, the church, the senior center? Oh, yeah, I met them at senior center. So again, you use that as a strategy. Here's where the auditory, visual, and kinesthetic can be helpful if you're trying to retrieve that information. Use all three channels because one can back up another. If you use all three to get the information in there in the first place, you can use all three to try to retrieve it more easily done. So let's talk about some mind busters. What impairs our cognitive functioning, including memory? The big one we most, most of us think about is dementia. Alzheimer's is a form of dementia. Sometimes we think of them as the same thing. Dementia is just a broad category of diseases that impair cognitive function. Alzheimer's is one example of that. It's the one we're most aware of because most, a lot of people suffer from it. But there are other kinds of dementias, blue body cell disease, uh, crushfield Jakob disease, things that affect our cognitive function. Right now, it's estimated about 5 million people suffer from Alzheimer's at different levels. Uh, probably everybody in here knows someone, maybe in your family, maybe in your social network, that has or has had Alzheimer's. It's not curable. They don't have a cure for you. What we can do is look at lifestyle factors that can contribute to it, like a high-fat diet, a lack of exercise and activity, again, not getting good circulation up there, not keeping our brains active. Now, you can do all those things. It doesn't guarantee you're not going to get Alzheimer's. In fact, the longer you live, the more likely you'll at least get the early stages of it. Past 85, a lot of people have at least some version of it, some element of it. But what we learned from the Nun study is that you can still have it in the early stages and still be functioning pretty fine because you've built up that cognitive reserve. Right? That's why it's important. Stroke is another one. Stroke is usually an interruption of blood flow to the brain. We know the brain needs blood flow to get oxygen and glucose. If a blood vessel breaks or it gets blocked, blood doesn't get to that part of the brain, that part of the brain gets injured. Depending upon the extent of the blockage or the interruption of blood flow, some strokes are recoverable from. That's why rehabilitation and the especially in the first year after stroke, is very important, both physically and mentally, because it helps restore some of those connections. It can work around the damaged part of the brain. So that's why that rehabilitation is so important. Depression. People that are chronically or, or clinically depressed often have trouble thinking, motivating themselves, problem solving. Uh, you know, dealing with other kinds of fa factors in life. It's just hard to do things, including thinking when you're depressed. So, again, we know that a lot of seniors now are, are getting depression. There's a lot of losses you suffer as you get older. 
if that is affecting you, you should talk to your health care provider because there are things you can do about depression. Fatigue. And not just losing a night's sleep, but chronic fatigue over time can cause you to have cognitive impairment. It can you know, affect your memory, affect your thinking process. It's hard to get through the day when you're tired. So again, chronic fatigue is one thing that can affect your memory and other cognitive functions. Stress, we've talked about that before. We all experience stress to some degree, but for chronic or prolonged stress, we need to try to manage it more effectively. Combinations of medication and drugs. If you're on a new drug regimen and you notice that your thinking is not quite as clear, check with your pharmacist or your healthcare provider because there may be some synergy between some of the med medications that you're on that may be causing some of that impairment. Alcohol, not talking about a glass of wine for meals, talking about alcohol abuse. We know that over time it can damage the brain. And not using it. And what we're talking about here is Actively using your brain, recalling things, re, you know, looking at photographs and talking about it with your family, doing things that activate your memory and your thinking process. Very important. So that's the, the downside. Let's talk about the good side. What are some mind boosters that can get you thinking? Remember the group, uh, the village people, the uh, late 70s, or the disco group? Well, they're a little older now, but they're trying to make a comeback, but they changed their name. They're now the retirement village people. <laughs> And they're saying about the YMCA, they're saying about ARP. Now we're going to use that ARP as a mnemonic device to remember four strategies to improve our memory and our thinking. ARP, we all know what ARP is, right? You hit 50, you get that invitation. A stands for attention. We talked a lot about that tonight. That the more we pay attention to something, the more likely it is it's going to get into our head, we're going to remember it. It starts with attention. The foundation of good memory is attention. So working on attention can be one helpful thing. Second A stands for association. The more you can connect that new information with something you already know, the more likely it is it's going to stick in your brain. And remember it later on. So when you meet someone at an event like this, who do they remind you of? What's some outstanding feature about them? What can you associate that new person or name with something that's familiar to you? So the more of those connections you can build, the more likely is you're going to remember that name. But if you keep that name in isolation, then it's harder to remember. R stands for rehearsal repetition. So periodically ask you where different things were associated with the list of things we're going to buy. That was repetition and rehearsal. So learning something new, the more you repeat it, the more you rehearse it, the more you create those dendritic connections that have that information in your brain. And finally, make it personal. If I really want to remember this, I'm going to make the effort to do that. So I really want to remember that person's name or that date or whatever it is. I, I really make it personally meaningful to you. Now, you can do all four of these things and you're still going to forget. But you're more likely to remember when you combine these strategies and use them to really reinforce the things you want to remember and use in your life. So what do we know from research on the, the brains, brain cells and mental, mental fitness? There's a lot of products out there. How many know what Lumosity is? Some of you probably use Lumosity, right? right? There are other programs like that out there. Are they working? Well, when you ask yourself, does mental exercise really work? The best answer they came up with right now is some things work for some people some of the time. Now, there's a book out now uh, called Smarter by Dan Hurley. He's a writer for the New York Times. Just came out recently. He put him through, himself through a regimen of training for about a year to see if he could increase his intelligence. So he signed up for Lumosity. He got into a physical fitness program. He went around to all the researchers on brain science and asked them, well, what works? And there's, you know, again, there's, there's debate about what actually works. He even used a, a nicotine patch, because there was some research that shows that nicotine can boost mental energy. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend that, but that's something he tried. He, he learned the chance <laughs> his intelligence. Now, I don't want to throw anyone I'm talking about as something that's going to make you smarter necessarily, increase your intelligence. What I want to talk about is a program of fitness that will help you keep your mind sharp as you get older and hold on to what you got and, again, build that cognitive <laughs> reserve. So if you do have a, a stroke or you know, develop a dementia like Alzheimer's down the road, 
you're more prepared for it. So the things that seem to work for mental exercise are things that build your working memory, some of the activities we did tonight. We have to hold on to information for a while before you use it, do something with it. Things that require problem solving. That's where you get into that fluid intelligence, things that you're not familiar with. Things that require flexibility, so you're not just focused on one thing, you come up with different possibilities. And things that increase processing speed. So for example, a Japanese researcher has a program of basically doing simple math equations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, just you know, like two times five, three plus four, several columns, and you do it for speed. If I gave you all day, it'd be easy to do. But we have to do as many problems in 30 or 60 seconds as you can, it builds your processing speed. So that's an activity that, that seems to work. So here's what I'm going to recommend. On the other side of that handout that you've got, something called the Multiple Intelligences Model. And I'm sharing that with this comes from uh, Howard Gardner. He's a researcher over at Harvard. Again, he's talked about multiple ways that we're intelligent. I'm not going to debate whether or not that's a legitimate model. But I think it's useful to think about how many ways can I exercise my, my mind? And so a big thing right now in the fitness field is what they call cross-training. So we do resistance exercises to build strength. We do flexibility exercises. We do endurance exercises. We don't just do one thing. So in our brain gym, we're going to do use that model to talk about different ways we can keep ourselves mentally sharp. First one is the verbal linguistic. Many of you like to do crossword puzzles. You like to read. You like to debate. You like to have conversations. Great. Continue doing that. Anything that gets you to use language in different ways. Now, if you do, for example, you do crossword puzzles and you're good at that, you can either increase the challenge or you can do a different kind of linguistic puzzle, like a word jumble or something like that, or word puzzles. So verbal linguistic is one way, using language. The mathematical logic, so again, learning how to do math. If you, know, if you didn't like to do math in high school, doesn't mean you can't learn some things right now. So challenge yourself maybe with logic puzzles, things that require reasoning skills. So math problems, logic puzzles, things that require that kind of reasoning ability. Visual spatial. Okay, another way we can exercise enjoying art, just going to a, a museum, uh, looking at the paintings, going with a docent to learn more about the artist or the, the style, uh, learning about painting. Some of you may like to paint, taking a class. If you're not artistic, you can take a class in painting or drawing, just so you're exercising that part of your brain. Uh, visual spatial uh, things would be like three-dimensional puzzles. You know, if you like to do jigsaw puzzles, putting things together would be another way to exercise this. Navigating yourself around, uh, again, orienteering or just navigating around the town, taking a different route home tonight that you're not used to, and just trying to figure out how to get home from there. So again, another way to exercise that. <laughs> you don't get there. Get a GPS. <laughs> body kinesthetic. Again, using your body. I know they have Tai Chi and yoga classes here. That would be a great way to do that. Pilates, dancing, things that get you using your body in different ways. If you have some, some uh, health problems or you know, chronic problems with your you know, not being able to do exercise, find some ways to use movement in some way. There's something that you can do. Musical rhythmic. Now, how many of you play a musical instrument or singers? Anybody here? I sing. There you go. OK. So some of you actually are do, do this already. For the rest of you, you could potentially learn a musical instrument. That's one way to do this. You can listen to music you're not familiar with. So if you like classical music, that's all you've been listening to, try listening to jazz or country western. Doesn't mean you gotta like it, but you're exposing your hearing to something that is not that's not familiar to you. And that's what's exercising the brain. Go to a concert. Uh, so again, musical rhythmic is a way to do that. Um, my wife and I used to go to drumming class before my arthritis got into my hands. That kind of rhythmic drumming. Uh, there might be some drumming circles around here. Interpersonal. Remember how important other people are to keeping our minds healthy as we get older. So finding ways to engage other people at senior centers like this, with your own network, your social network. Make sure that you're, you know, several times a week you're with other people, getting together with others. 
volunteer it. You, know, you all have rich wisdom and, and knowledge and experience. Share that with others through volunteering. And the last one is the intra-person, inside yourself. So this might be your, whatever your faith practice might be. It could be uh, meditation. Mindfulness is a big thing out there right now. Mindfulness, meditation, learning more about that. Um, prayer, reflection on where you are in your life, what's important to you right now, what your values are. All these are intrapersonal kinds of things. So what I'm going to suggest is you look at these different ways that you can exercise your brain. Pick one to try over the next week or so. Something different. Because here's what's going to make it a, a part of your, your mental fitness program. You want to make these things novel, something you're not familiar with. So it's challenging your mind that way. You want to vary it, so you try something this week, maybe try something different the coming week. Maybe take a class in something you always wanted to learn more about. And you make it challenging. If it's easy for you to grasp and get, it's not going to exercise your mind. So make it challenging. So again, if you're doing crossword puzzles, you like the Hartford Curve Port, crossword puzzle, you do it really easily, or New Haven Register, try doing the New York Times puzzle. Make it a little bit more challenging. Elevate the challenge to exercise your mind. So these are the things that you can incorporate into your own program. This is something I've been working on. It's a thinking cap, high-tech thinking cap that's going to exercise and stimulate your brain. I haven't perfected it yet. So until I get this out on the market, I've got some other resources for you. These are, there's a ton of stuff out there. If you go to a library, you're going to find a bunch of stuff, certainly on the internet. But these are the places to start. Keep a Brain Alive, Lars Katz is a neurologist. This is a book that's been around for a while, but it has simple things like doing the alphabet backwards, brushing your teeth with your opposite hand, or eating with your opposite hand. Mm. Things that challenge your, your brain and your mind to do things that it's not used to doing. Mm. Brain Rules has came out fairly recently. John Medina has done a lot of research on what we know about the brain. And so he's got a DVD program, he's got a website. Um, you can get a lot of information about the brain through that. And then for your kind of your consumer awareness, the Sharp Brains Guide to Brain Fitness covers a lot of things like Lumosity and some of the other sites, some of the other programs out there, what works, what doesn't work. So before you, have, you know, put some money into some of these things, you may want to look at that. And then some websites, those of you that access the internet. ARP has a great brain section with a lot of exercise on it, free. They've also got a subscription service with uh, Brain HQ that you have to pay for, but they have some free stuff there as well. The Brain Rules website by John Medina has some good stuff on it, Sharp Brains. And the Data Foundation, they do a lot of research on the neurosciences. So if you want to learn more about Alzheimer's, stroke, other things that can affect the brain or improve the brain, that's a, a good place to get some updated information. They have a newsletter that goes out periodically that you can subscribe to for free. So any resources that anyone else wants to share that you found helpful before I wrap things up? Yes? I just wondered if you had um, some place that's doing research, if you wanted to participate in the functional MRI. Good question. Um, Chris, you're doing some research at the Yukon Health Center. Do you know if anything, were they looking for some subjects? <laughs> not, in, not in that realm right now. I know Yale, I think, is doing some yeah. things in that area. You might check with Yale. Good question. The Women's Institute. Any other resources, things that you found helpful from your own experience? Yes. Findmyglasses.org. So again, another website to check into. Thank you. So let me leave you with this kind of a mashup of, of Latin and Greek. It said, Florient and Drite, which means may your brain cells flourish. <laughs> so hopefully you've learned some stuff tonight that will help your brain cells flourish. I'll stick around if you have any questions. I know we're kind of at the end of our time here. Thank you.